The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Touching Lives. If you refuse to condemn what God condemns, you'll neither be loving nor graceful. It is cowardly. Jesus gives us a voice to speak both grace and truth, and if we don't use our voice for both, we lose our voice for either. Teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This is Touching Lives with James Merritt. I want you to turn to the Gospel of John. There's four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're in the New Testament. I want you to turn to John chapter 8. Now here's the story. Here's what we're going to read. This is a story of a woman who had been literally caught red-handed. She was literally caught in the act. Matter of fact, I didn't know this. There's a legal term for being caught doing something red-handed. It's, it's in Latin, and, and it's known as in flagrante delicto. In Latin, it means in blazing offense. And what that term means is, it means that you're a criminal that's been actually caught in the act of committing a crime. Now, this woman, and this is strange, but it just happened. This woman had literally been caught in the act of adultery. I don't mean caught walking into the hotel room or walking out of the hotel room. She was caught in the act of adultery. Now, this woman was ashamed and she was afraid. She was ashamed because she'd been caught in the act of having relations with a man she was not married to. She was afraid because of the penalty for such an act. And you're going to see in a moment, the penalty for that was death. Now, you may be looking in your Bible and you may say, wait a minute, I've got a little note here that says, this is not found in some of the oldest manuscripts, this, this story, and it's not. But many Bible scholars, and I'm one of them, I'm not a Bible scholar, but I believe what they believe, many biblical scholars believe this story belongs in the Bible for two reasons. Number one, it rings true to what we know about Jesus. And number two, it totally perfectly fits the context of what happens before the story and then after the story. Here's the point. As we look at this story, regardless of where you might be right now, spiritually or morally, you are in this story. Every one of us is in this story. Let me give you an example. If you're kind of more of a truthy person than a gracey person, and you think that sin and, 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 and when people do wrong, if you think we ought to deal with it in a tough way, well, there's something for you to learn. If, on the other hand, you're kind of more of a gracey person, right? You're kind of more into the grace and the mercy. And you think that sin ought to be dealt with not in a tough way. Sin ought to be dealt with in a tender way. Then there's something for you to learn. Now, we're all in this story, and we all can learn a life-changing lesson from this story. Because here's what we're going to learn. We're going to learn today how we should see others the way God sees us. Let me just stop right there. It would be amazing to you how your perspective on a lot of people would change if you would start seeing people the way God sees people. If you'd quit seeing people the way you think you ought to see people and start seeing people the way God sees people. What you're going to see in this story, you're going to see grace and truth in perfect harmony, okay? So what we're going to do today is we're going to take everything we've learned the last three weeks, and we're going to summarize it in this one message, all right? First of all, here's what we see. With truth, we see the reality of sin. When you look at sin through the eyes of truth, you see the reality of sin. Now, this is where the story takes place. We're in John chapter 8, verse 2. At dawn, he appeared again, that is Jesus, in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. Now, this story takes place in a temple, which back in that day was their church. It actually took place in the outer court of the temple where everybody could gather. Now, the, 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 the outer court of the temple, that was a real popular place that people liked to go to for Bible study. So, so, so very, uh, often uh, in the morning, people would, would take off from work or before they would go to work, they would gather gathered there in the outer court, and they didn't know who would be teaching. It could be this rabbi or that rab rabbi. Today it happened to be Jesus. It was a very popular place for rabbis and biblical scholars to teach the Bible. Well, on this particular morning, Jesus is teaching from God's Word. He's teaching from the Old Testament. They're gathered around, and He's right in mid-sermon. Now, you're about to witness something that happened in a church service that, as far as I know, never happened before, and as far as I know, it has never happened again. Verse 3, 
the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. Now get the picture. It's kind of like I'm up here preaching, and all of a sudden somebody drags a woman right down the aisle of our church, all right? So the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone, to stone such women. Now, what do you say? So, so here, here Jesus is teaching, and he's interrupted a bunch of religious lawyers and Pharisees, drag this woman across the pavement, make this a kangaroo court. They throw her at the feet of Jesus, and they accuse her of committing a felony, not a misdemeanor. She is committing a felony against Jewish law. Now, who were the Pharisees, and who were these lawyers? They were the Jewish Gestapo. Their, their, their job was to find out anybody they thought that might be breaking the law, and they were to bring them to justice. Now, let me tell you about the Pharisees, okay? They were experts at spitting truth and killing grace. Spitting truth, but killing grace. And here's the problem. Their case was airtight. This woman had been caught in adultery. No question about it. Oh, by the way, before we go any further, the story is really not about the woman. She's just a pawn in a chess game. The real target in the story is not the woman. Who do you think the real target is? Yes, Jesus. They're not after the woman. They couldn't care less about her. The real target is Jesus. They were not after her. They were after him. We know that from verse 6. They were saying this testing him, not her, testing him so that they might have grounds for accusing him. In other words, this was a gotcha question. This was a trap. Okay, Jesus, we have caught this woman in adultery. You know what the law says. The law says she ought to die. What say you? So what in the world is Jesus going to do? It, you know, the reason I love these stories is because when you first read them, until you really understand them, every time you read them, you go, well, there's no way out. They've got him. He's dead. Either way he goes, it's a dead end street. So what does Jesus do? Well, I would have never thought about this. Look what he does. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. Now, that raises a question in your mind, I know. So, what, why did he stoop, and what is he writing? Easy answer. <laughs> we don't know. I don't know why he stooped down. And I don't know what he was writing. As a matter of fact, here's an interesting little fact for you. Did you know this is the only time in Scripture where Jesus is ever recorded as having written down anything? We don't ever read about Jesus signing a document. We don't ever, write, uh, we don't, we don't ever read about Jesus writing a letter. We don't ever read, read about Jesus signing His name. Well, this is the only time we ever read anywhere in Scripture that Jesus wrote anything. Okay? So, anybody's guess, including mine, would be pure speculation. I want to get that out front, okay? It would be pure speculation. However, since it's not against the law to speculate, and since I am the pastor, I'm going to speculate. Okay? This is just my guess. I think Jesus may have stooped down in the sand, and I think He may have written three words. I think He may have written down grace and truth. Just a thought. Because as they were building their case against Him, Jesus is building His case against them. And He turns the tables, which He was great at doing, because here's what He does. They're expecting Him to pass judgment on the woman, right? He says, okay, you want me to pass judgment? Glad to do so. Glad to accommodate what you want me to do. However, I'm not going to pass judgment on the woman. I think I'll pass judgment on the Judges, verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first one to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. What a stunning turn of events. 
They see it's not just her that needs judgment, it's them that needs judgment. Because see, truth always reminds you about two things concerning our own moral failures. Number one, nobody's without sin. The pastor's not without sin, the pope's not without sin, the preacher's not without sin, the pastor's not without sin, nobody's without sin. Number two, except for the grace of God, we would always be in the other person's place. You know, there's an old saying you may remember that, that uh, we've said, and it really is true. When you point a finger at someone, you got three pointing back at you. So true. Nobody's without sin. And except for the grace of God, you would be in the other person's place. Now, the story doesn't end there. As a matter of fact, the story's just getting started. Because with truth, we see the reality of sin. But with grace, we can seek redemption for sin. With truth, we see the reality, I'm guilty, caught red-handed, no doubt about it, no defense, can't get out of the situation. However, with grace, we can seek redemption for sin. Now, Jesus has a way of clearing the field of all the opponents, and it happens again. Let's read this again. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her again. He stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who, were, who heard began to go away one at a time, the other ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now, nobody's left. As a matter of fact, apparently even the people in the Bible class thought, I think we'll leave too. I think we better go back home too. I think we really don't belong here either. And so they, they were under conviction and they left. So all you've got enough now is Jesus and this adulterous woman. Now you think, well, she's good to go. Not yet. Because the facts still haven't changed. She has been caught. She is guilty. Her reputation is ruined. She will wear a scarlet A on her chest the rest of her life. From now on, wherever she goes out in public, heads will turn. People will point. Lips will whisper. Because it's not hearsay. It's not gossip. She's guilty. They've got the pictures. They've got the DVD. She's guilty. And everybody knows she's guilty. The Pharisees know it. The lawyers know it. Jesus knows it. She knows it. She is guilty. So I want you to picture this scene. Two different people could never have stood so close together. She's guilty, but he's guiltless. She's been caught red-handed. He's never been caught at anything. She has broken God's law. She's standing before the one that wrote that law. Now, you might say she's gone from the frying pan into the fire. And so here she is. She knows what's coming now. She's braced for this hurricane called judgment. But instead, she feels this cool breeze called grace. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. By the way, you notice he calls her woman, just uh, for clarification. In that day, ladies, that was a name that was used out of respect. That was not a derogatory term. As a matter of fact, you may remember, it was the same word that he used for his mother. Today, we'd use, it, we would use the word lady. When he looked at her and he said, woman, she had been called a lot of names. She had been called woman. So she looks at the hands of Jesus. Hands are empty of rocks, but one hand is full of grace, and the other hand is full of truth. Now, let's just time out right here. This was not a get out of jail free card, because forgiveness is never free. Do you understand why Jesus did not condemn this woman? He said, wait a minute. So he's just kind of letting her off? No. He's just kind of pretending it didn't happen? No. He's just kind of giving her a free pass? No. The reason why Jesus did not condemn this woman is because he was about to go to the cross and be condemned for this woman. That's why he said, you're not condemned because I'm going to be condemned for you. Because think about it. Jewish law said she was guilty of deserving death, adultery. 
God's law said all sin is deserving of death, which is exactly why Jesus died for all sin. Here's the thing. If you ever wonder how God reacts when you blow it and you do and we do, if you ever wonder how God reacts when we blow it, when we, you know, when we just don't get it right, when we absolutely fail, when we fall on our face, if you ever wonder how God reacts when you come to Him and you fess up to your mess up, you ought to frame these words on the hall, on the wall of your heart and never forget them. Every time you come to God and you fess up to your mess up, here's what God says, neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. Now, here's our problem. If this story had been written today, if a movie had been made about the story today, do you know how this story would end? Right here. It ended right here. I, you know, that, that's how our culture would end this story, right there. That's how our society would end that story, right there. I spent seven years in a seminary that taught me or tried to teach me to end every story right there. But with Jesus, the story never ends right there. That's where we all wish the story would end. I don't condemn you. They don't condemn you. You're okay. I'm okay. God's okay. It's all good. You are free to go. That's not where the story ends. Because with truth, we see the reality of sin. With grace, we can seek the redemption of sin. But watch this. When you put the two together, with grace and truth, we will show repentance from sin. With grace and truth, we will show repentance from sin. Because the story doesn't end there. That's not the last thing Jesus says. Oh, I know you love to cut it off right there. Neither do I condemn you. But then he says this. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. See, without that last statement, the story would be incomplete. Without that last statement, it would be all grace, but no truth. Without that last statement, as a matter of fact, it would be giving grace at the expense of truth. And let me just tell you, I'm not throwing rocks, no pun intended. I'm not throwing rocks at anybody. I'm just telling you, there are a lot of churches out there, and they're not too far from, some, some are not too far from us. You, if you just want all grace and no truth, they're out there. They'll tell you, I don't care what your lifestyle is. I don't care how you live your life. I don't care what you're doing right now. It's all good. God loves you. God accepts you and God affirms you just the way you are. You just live any way you want to, do anything you want to, say anything you want to, take anything you want to, be anything you want to be. It's all good. That's not us. And that's not Jesus. And that is not the Bible. You know, we've all heard the saying, God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin, that is a theologically absolutely true statement. Because I want you to see, you ready for this? This is important. The woman's sin was forgiven. It was not excused. Big difference. The woman's sin was forgiven, but it was not excused. Jesus is not just kind of winking at this sin. He's not pretending he doesn't see it. He doesn't stick his hand in the, in the, in, in the sand. The story is not teaching us you can't call wrong, wrong. It, it's not teaching us you cannot judge the sinful action of others. So listen carefully. Jesus was not saying that only sinless people can judge the actions of other people. He wasn't teaching that. Because if that were true, if only sinless people could judge other people or judge, what, judge the actions of other people, you wouldn't have justice. Because if judges today had to be perfect and sinless, you wouldn't have any judges sitting on the bench and there could be no justice. Here's what we're going to learn. The truth of the matter is, we not only have the right to condemn whatever God condemns, we have the responsibility to condemn what God condemns. We don't have just the right to do it. We have the responsibility to do it. So here's what I want you to hear. Are we to judge the thief? Absolutely not. But we're to judge his stealing. Are we to judge a liar? Absolutely not. But we are to judge his lying. Are we to judge the adulterer? Absolutely not. But we are to judge the adultery. 
Now, I want you to hear me carefully, because you hear this all the time. Who are you to judge? I'm nobody to judge. But there's a difference between condemning the sin and judging the sinner. It's not my job to judge anybody. I don't judge anybody. It's not my job. However, I do condemn rightly the actions God condemns. So, on the one hand, notice the grace in this statement, because there's, there's real grace here. Listen to what he says. He doesn't say, now, if you will go and sin no more, I'll not condemn you. He didn't say that. He didn't say, if you'll guarantee me from now on you'll never sin again, I won't condemn you. He didn't say that either. What he said in effect was, okay, I don't, now you don't. I don't, now you don't. Here's the way it works, he says. I don't condemn you now. Now you go and sin no more. That's the way it works. See, there are a lot of people today, here's the Jesus they want. They want this Jesus that says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin some more. <laughs> That's what Hollywood wants you to believe. That's what our culture wants you to believe. That's what our society wants you to believe. But that is not the Jesus of the Scripture. Because when Jesus offers grace, it's always with truth. Neither do I condemn you. That's grace. Go and leave your life of sin. That's truth. Now, there's a biblical word for leaving your life of sin. It starts with an R. We don't hear it much anymore. It's called repentance. We don't hear that word much anymore. People don't like that word. But repentance is actually the flip side of grace. Because when you turn to God and you receive His offer of grace, you've got to turn away from sin as you receive the judgment of truth. Now listen, we're living in a culture today that tells us it is wrong to call something wrong if all of a sudden one day our culture decides it's no longer wrong. So if I call something wrong that the culture says is no longer is wrong, I'm intolerant. I'm a bigot. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm prejudiced. I'm biased. Okay, we're, that's, that's what we're being told. Well, the culture says, I don't care what that book says. I don't care what God says. The culture says, if we say it's right, you say it's right. I got one thing to say about that. That's wrong. That's just wrong. If you refuse to condemn what God condemns, you're not being loving or graceful. I'm going to say that again. If you refuse to condemn what God condemns, you're neither be loving nor graceful. It is cowardly. Jesus gives us a voice to speak both grace and truth, and if we don't use our voice for both, we lose our voice for either. I'm to speak grace. I'm to speak truth. I've said this at the beginning. I'm going to say it at the end of this series. I want us to be known as a church. Listen. I want our church to be known not for what we are against, but what we are for. I want to make that real plain. I want to be known for what we are for more than what we are against. But here's the truth. Anytime you stand for something, you automatically have to stand against something else. You don't get to, you don't get to have your cake and eat it too. If you stand for something, you stand against something else. So, if you want to stand for what the culture says is right, regardless of what God says, then you stand against what God says, even if God says it. That's just the way it works. Now, we don't know this woman's name. We don't. But I'm glad we know her story. Because there's not a story anywhere in the Bible that gives the balance of grace and truth and how Jesus was filled with both better than this story. I said this and I'm going to say it again. What is so sad is that so many unbelievers out there only know two kinds of believers. Too many unbelievers out there only know two kinds of believers. They know believers who speak truth without grace. And I've been guilty of doing that at times. And, and then they know believers who are super graceful, but they never share truth. What we need to be Listen, and what we will be if we're full of Jesus is someone who in a spirit of grace will always love other people enough to tell the truth. Stay tuned for a final word from Dr. Merritt. 
One of the great joys in my life was becoming a father to my three wonderful sons. They've been the source of some of the greatest blessings in my life. When I first learned I was to be a dad, I turned to the scripture for advice and found a treasure trove of truth to help me become the best dad I could be. I was so moved by the wisdom I found in Proverbs that I wrote a book called What God Wants Every Dad to Know based on the teachings of King Solomon. For this Father's Day, I'm making this gift available to you for only $10, and I invite you to order a copy for yourself or someone that you know. It deals with all the hard topics of fatherhood, including finances, sex education, anger, friendships. Call our Help Center at 1-800-413-1131 or go to our website at www.touchinglives.org to order your copy today. Thanks for watching Touching Lives. Pray for all of the fathers you know on this Father's Day. And I would say this, Dad, to be transparent. Do an even better job of following what Solomon teaches us in God's Word than I did, and you will be a great dad. God bless you. We've come to the end of our series called Balance, and I hope you've learned to see that grace and truth are equal partners in our heart as we live like Jesus. Someone once said that being too filled with truth is mean, but being too filled with grace is meaningless. I believe that's true. But the good news is we can live a balanced life because we have the ultimate example to go by. Jesus showed us exactly how to live a life completely full of grace and totally full of truth. Let Jesus be your guide as you live balanced, ready to offer grace, but ready to share truth to a world that needs to hear it. Now more than ever, the world needs balanced believers who in a spirit of grace are willing to love people enough to share with them God's truth. Before I close, I wanna thank you, our faithful prayer partners and financial partners for supporting this work. I cannot tell you how much your partnership means to me. I know you're always in my thoughts and prayers. I bless you even now in the name of our Lord Jesus. And know that I look forward to meeting with you again next week right here on this station. Touching Lives, teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This program is sponsored by Touching Lives Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.